we've already had a really rich uh, hour of conversation with you and your community, and, and we really look forward to more. So I've titled this talk, A Journey of Discovery and Community, and I'm really excited to share with you uh, my journey of discovery in a, a community, a beautiful community, um, called Muskegon. And uh, I'm not homegrown, I'm a transplant, or a newbie, as they say, uh, but I really love Muskegon, I love its people, and I'm honored to share my, my enthusiasm um, with this community here. I didn't know a lot about C3 um, until just a couple of weeks ago when Jane asked if I would consider coming in March. Um, and she shared with me a document called the Charter for Compassion, which she said really defined um, C3 and what it, what it is, what it wants to become. Um, and I have to tell you that to have a, a community marked by a desire to provide compassion to other human beings, especially where they're suffering, is a really remarkable and refreshing thing. So I'm looking forward to learning more. So I serve a geography that we call the core city of Muskegon um, and Muskegon Heights um, through an organization called Community and Compass. Um, maybe just a show of hands, anybody heard of Community and Compass? A few of you. Some of you in the room have been supporters of Community and Compass and um, our efforts in the, in the core city. So I want to say thank you for that. Some of you are probably less familiar with what we do in the downtown neighborhoods. Um, so I'm just going to take a couple of minutes and share, because the story of Community and Compass is really linked arm in arm to this story of discovery. So in a phrase, you can see Community and Compass is about transforming communities from the inside out. Our um, vision is a vision for restoring neighborhoods where all neighbors have identified and have opportunity to use their gifts towards the building of their own community. We use a methodology and a philosophy called asset-based community development. We talked about it a little bit this morning, um, or ABCD for short. And it's a philosophy that really leans on the gift or the asset that is present in a geography and says, there's enough that we are, and we're gonna start with what's enough. So whether that's the gift of the people, individuals, the organizations, the institutions in the core city neighborhoods of Muskegon, there's enough. And it's not to say that the community is without, without struggle and without challenge, um, but we think that if we identify our gifts, the gifts of individuals, organizations, institutions, and organize them towards collective impact and collective vision, we can make tremendous uh, change. So this morning is just gonna be kind of a collage, a story collage, if you, if you would permit me. Um, I'm gonna start out with one from the biblical text from its Old Testament. Um, how many, oh, I just lost my, how many of you are familiar with the story of the dry bones in Ezekiel? A few of you? Um, just pull it up here. Um, sorry, just trying to find it here. Um, this is, I know, I know that not all of us are coming from the same faith tradition, and this is a bit of a wild and crazy kind of an otherworldly account that stretches the bounds of what we know as real. And I'm going to just ask that you suspend your realism just for a, a, a couple of seconds and join me in this story. Because it's, it's a story that speaks life into places of despair. So here's kind of the Cliff Notes version of the story. You've got a group of people called Israel, and they know themselves as God's people. And they at the time feel uh, hopeless in exile. They're cut off from any chance of survival. Uh, the, the nation was dead, they're in captivity, their land was taken, their temple was taken, uh, they're deprived of their king, their national hopes had been dashed, and restoration just seemed kind of impossible to this people group. And in the midst of this, God comes to Ezekiel and um, gives the vision of the dry bones as a sign. So God transports e Ezekiel to a valley full of dry bones, and God directs him to speak to the bones. 
So Ezekiel is supposed to tell these bones that God's going to make breath enter them and they will come to life. So this is all kind of crazy, I understand. Um, but Ezekiel does it, and as he watches the scene, the bones and sinews come back together. Muscles surround the bones, skin forms, and God breathes life into, back into the body. And the people realize this amazing thing, that dead bones are raised to life. So this was just a vision, right? It was a picture of what was to, to come, a picture of a very hopeful future that was completely apart um, from the current circumstances. So you didn't know you were gonna get a little Old Testament scripture here this morning, did you? So whether we sit comfortably in uh, listening to biblical text in church pews or not, this is a really good story. Um, and I think it's relevant wherever hope lacks, wherever people are crushed, and really, the, the vision of community and compass uh, could just as well read in the words of Ezekiel. We hope for that day when God whispers to our dry bones and makes breath, life, breath and life enter this neighborhood. We anticipate the day when our tendons are attached and flesh comes upon us and we're covered with skin. We work towards the day when breath is put back in our community and we come to life. So that's the vision the vision um, that really inspires our vision for downtown neighborhoods, a rebuilding of a community that has been torn apart by disinvestment, flight, racism, oppression, generations of poverty, a community who some say is uncertain of the way forward. And in the midst of this, we are invited and enticed to be sure of one thing, that dry bones will live. So how does this work out on the kind of a daily basis at Community Encompass. I'm gonna list some of the initiatives and you're gonna see some pictures um, while I list them. They always say pictures are worth a thousand words, right? Um, if I can get this right, look at that. So Sacred Suds is a laundry and shower facility and a community center where people can get a hot meal and spend some time online. They can get their hair cut. They can get their taxes done, sometimes all at the same time. <laughs> um, Bethany Housing Ministries is a program that uh, rehabs forgotten houses and turns them into affordable housing for working wage families in the downtown neighborhoods, sometimes as rentals, sometimes as home ownership opportunities. We are also the state designated housing assessment and resource agency, and that's basically a, a program that connects homeless individuals and families um, to homes through financial <laughs> assistance and case management. We have a learning lab, which is basically a computer center for adult learners. Um, we have a reading buddy program at Nelson School. Um, this is our a couple pictures of our after school center for academic excellence. And then uh, the summer extension of our uh, school-based programs is a summer day camp called Catch Camp. Um, oh, and McLaughlin Grows. Um, by a show of hands, anybody heard of McLaughlin Grows Urban Farm? More of you. <laughs> than Community Encompass. It's just a program of Community Encompass. Um, it has gotten some recent, uh, somewhat recent press because of a new partnership with Mercy Health. We're actually in the front yard of the Hackley campus. And we're extremely part proud of this program because it has deep roots in neighborhood organizing and visioning. Our neighbors actually came up with this idea. Um, and it's achieved recognition for being a premier urban ag program in the state of Michigan. Our work with youth kind of cuts across all of these programs. We call it the Youth Empowerment Project, or YEP for short. Um, and it's basically a leadership development uh, program for high school teens that gives them work experience, a little bit of cash in their pockets, a vision for their future that includes college, and a chance to build and rebuild their own community. So for example, uh, YEPs are hired to rehab homes or do lawn care for seniors um, during the summer or be leaders of that neighborhood um, catch camp, summer day camp. And they learn job skills and life skills and people skills through these work experiences, which for our kids are often the first experiences at a job. Um, so it's very cool stuff. Um, I want to tell you just a little story about how I got involved in neighborhood work. So 10 years ago, over 10 years now, I moved to Muskegon and I really wanted to work with youth, specifically with youth in poverty. And I had just come from living in Japan about four years, um, had done a bicycle trip through a number of countries in Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia. 
And I wanted to translate what I learned in those communities overseas to communities back home in the States. So we moved to Muskegon, I started working with downtown youth, and I, I quickly began to see that if I was gonna work with kids and have any kind of impact, I had to work with their families, working with their moms and their dads and kind of getting to know their home life, um, engaging there. And so I did, but then I realized this, that I can't really work effectively with families um, unless I'm connected with the community, the environment that they come from, right? So like the, the streets, the, sometimes the police, the, the community. And then there was something more as I realized that there was kind of this larger context behind individuals. I began to wonder this, if I, if I really want to change an environment, possibly the best way to do it is to become part of the environment, becoming a neighbor and moving into the city. And so we did, Dan and I, we moved into a neighborhood that seemed strange, uh, foreign, and maybe a little dangerous. And that really became the beginning of Community Encompass, this journey of a young, educated, white couple, graduates of Calvin College, full of dreams and tons of illusions, <laughs> moving into the core city in an effort to be changing, um, or to be part of that changing environment in a neighborhood of poverty, to make life better for kids, uh, for their families, and for the, for the community. So what did we see? In a word, dry bones. Um, abandoned houses, broken windows, cracked sidewalks, vacancies, broken families, failing schools, unemployment, hopelessness. It's really the stuff that anybody from the outside sees at first. And these images really assault the eyes and the heart. And you're left feeling uh, quite unsettled because what you see is so different from what you know, the world you know. And you're left feeling maybe pity uh, for the folks that have no choice but to live there. So almost over 10 years has passed, and we've learned so much. Um, things that are fact, things that the racial makeup of the core city is 45% black, 44% white, 8% Hispanic, a smattering of others. Socioeconomically, the area median income in the core cities is 19,000. Um, that's compared to an area median income of 29,000 for the city of Muskegon and 39,000 for the county of Muskegon. Some of the housing realities is that two-thirds of the properties are either vacant or rental. Let that soak in. <laughs> We've also learned that things that are common, maybe even touche, that it's not about programs, it's about people. That it's not about charity. In fact, charity can actually hurt communities of poverty rather than help. That sometimes charity is a perversion of giving it affirms the superiority of the, of the giver, binds the recipient, demands gratitude, humiliates her, and reduces her to a lower state than what she had before. I'm gonna say that again. Sometimes charity is a perversion of giving, it affirms the superiority of the giver, binds the recipient, demands gratitude, humiliates her, and reduces her to a lower state than she had before. But that's a conversation for another day. Um, beyond the facts and, and beyond the touche, we've learned some really important things about um, ourselves and the community that we live in. We've realized that sometimes, um, well, sometimes we've learned it the hard way, that no, we're not here to bring God or really any kind of answer to a community of desolation, but rather that a greater being is already at work, breathing life into dry bones, that this is not a place of devastation and hopelessness, but rather a place of deep hope and faith, that this greater being is working through the people here already, rattling up the bones. There's a loud racket in our neighborhoods downtown of bones rattling and clanking, and it's the racket of neighbors who care about their neighborhood, about their block, about their neighbor. Our neighbors own a vision and a passion, and they are working tirelessly to make their community a good and healthy place for their kids to grow up in and their elders to grow old in. They're working hard to make their community a place of peace and joy and, and celebration. So what's, the le what's been the lesson for us in this? It's this, that it's really important to wait before acting. And, and that's really hard to do, right? When you see all of the brokenness in a community of poverty, we're fixers. We know what to do. We know how to gather the resources to get it done. I see a broken window and I want to fix it. But we've learned that it's important to hold on to these impulses to help and fix. 
It's important first to, to listen, step back, listen to our neighbors, learn about their dreams for their community and, and take their lead, pursue their gifts and their dreams and what they want to do. So it's been a paradigm shift for us, a shift that says I'm not going to focus my effort on what's wrong with the community and then devise a plan to, to fix it, but rather I'm going to spend my time and effort pursuing the gift and uh, discovering the gift. The people gifts, the neighbor leaders, where are they? What are they talking about? And how do I get alongside of their dream? And beyond finding them and listening to them, considering how I can give them opportunity to lead wherever possible. And that takes a different kind of stepping back. It's kind of a stepping aside, allowing for different voices, creating these spaces for new faces to lead, because I really think that building indigenous leaders, leaders from the community, is probably the single most important thing that we can do for the long-term health and vitality of the downtown neighborhoods of Muskegon. So a, a quick story, another quick story. Um, a few years back, Community Encompass bought a house in the unlikeliest of places, the corner of Fifth and Merrill in Nelson neighborhood. <coughs> Half of the block was vacant uh, and boarded up on both sides. There, this was a corner where there was drug trafficking and other kinds of trafficking. And we bought the house, it was actually a duplex, for $6,000 because no one else wanted it. And no one thought it was worthwhile to invest in. And we almost passed it by too, but then we stopped and we wondered, if not us, who? So we buy it, we put a plan together to rehab it, we hire some neighborhood youth to do the work. We say, here's a chance to learn, to get paid, to contribute. Um, and one of the, the uh, neighborhood youth that we hire is a young single, single mom named Sharita. And the guys and the, and the gals across the street, where all the trafficking is, um, they know her and she knows them. And for the next four or five months, they watch her come to work every day. They watch her put in windows and put up siding. They watch her paint and patch the walls. They watch her lay flooring and bring in appliances. And, and the guys across the street are proud of her. And I believe they help protect the investment because it's her investment and they are really loyal to her. They're proud of her. And she's a tremendously hard worker. Kimi can vouch for this. <laughs> and she starts to understand the, the vision of Community Encompass that really it's not about this one house getting fixed, but it's about transformation, the building and rebuilding of a, a community. And so we get to the end of the project and we, re we realize that maybe the rehab was the easiest part of this because who's going to rent this place? <laughs> who's going to live here? Um, so at the end of the project, she asks, can I move in? I want to be part of the transformation of this block. Unlikely neighborhood, unlikely house, unlikely neighbor, this single mom. But most of the time, it's the unlikeliest places and people that create the most surprising and unexpected answers. And sometimes we just have to get out of the way. So there's more stories, um, stories of vacant land turned to parks and productive green spaces, stories of kids becoming leaders, stories of blocks being reborn, stories of homelessness turned to home ownership and stability, stories of business districts coming alive, stories of neighbors who have been dismissed by society for years, finding their gifts, offering them to their neighbors, and for the first time maybe ever, being seen as having value and living into that. <coughs> So it's clear that what you read and hear about the core city isn't always true, or at least it's not the whole story. It's not a wasteland. It's not the wild west of lawlessness and carelessness. There's hope, there's care. There are beautiful, beautiful people who are working daily doing re redemptive and restoration work. So I share these stories with you as witness to the amazing work that's happening downtown among neighbors. neighbors some who have been here for decades, some that have just moved in. I'm continually surprised by the quality of deep care that motivates my neighbors to act and be and do incredible things for their community. We know that there's tons of labels to go around, uh, welfare fair recipient, criminal, bipolar, drug beat dad, ex-con, at-risk youth, but all of these words describe people as other. I hope the stories that you've shared, that I've shared with you today, the stories of Sharita and Sarah and my husband Dan, 
But they show that people are much more than the, the labels that society has branded, the, branded them with. That neighborhoods are, are more than their neighbors, or they're more than their labels, and that there's much more to discover when we pursue the heart and the gift of the other. <clears throat> that person that's different from you, that community that's strange to you, maybe that appears a little dangerous or foreign, the opportunity to discover is on us, to find their heart, their passion, their love, their gift, find what they care about, what motivates them to act. I always say pursue the gift in others with reckless abandon. So I'm gonna close um, after I show this slide of my many beautiful neighbors that I get to work alongside every day. I'm gonna share closing um, with three ways that I think C3 and its people can help towards this vision of transformation. I would imagine that driven by your charter of compassion, that you're already walking alongside individuals and communities, and so consider these things alongside of what you're already doing, um, and maybe helping to shape what you might do in the future. So uh, the first is to consider and assess your investments in outreach. Ask yourselves, what are we doing now to do outreach in the community? Where are your people resources? Where are your financial resources being invested in compassionate <coughs> community transformation? And make a list of them. And then plot them on a map. This is a map that we often use um, just to categorize efforts. Um, and we don't have time to go into this in, in detail. But a, just a quick overview of the community transformation continuum. Starts with direct services over on the left. Um, and these are the programs that kind of offer crisis assistance to individuals like uh, food trucks, uh, benevolent ministries, food pantries. It's what we call individual betterment. So the next circle, moving to the right, um, moves from individual betterment to individual development. And that involves programs that build skills in individuals, so mentoring, case management. Um, the next circle moves from a focus on the individual to a, a focus to a connection to the community, um, the community in which individuals live. So here an organization would define kind of a target area that they want to engage and develop a shared community vision with that, with that community. The next circle moves into community betterment activities, and that's kind of gathering the community, listening to them, planning things together like community cleanups. And then the following circle moves into community development activities. And these, again, are projects that are developed by neighbors, um, sometimes community celebrations. It could also involve housing development. And then the last circle um, moves into community organizing around just laws and policies, so that's like zoning ordinances, sometimes affordable housing, um, et cetera, it depends on the community. So I would just list your efforts and ask yourself, where do most of our activities fall? With a lot of communities of faith that, faith that we work with, most of their activities fall in the individual betterment and individual development circles. And I'm not saying at all that these circles are bad. Um, they're necessary without a doubt. There are and always will be crises where communities of faith need to step into the, into the gap, and we do that pretty well. But if we stop there, we end up managing people in poverty, or managing poverty rather than helping people out of poverty. We end up um, doing for Mary what Mary can do for herself. And while we may feel good, we actually may be doing harm. And the truth is that communities of faith, like C3, are called to intersect all of these realms you guys have a charter of compassion that's meant to impact all areas of our world and life. And so I would argue that communities of faith and your outreach efforts really need to move beyond individual betterment and development and push into some of these other arenas as well. A second thing to consider is realize that there is a cycle of poverty and that a huge piece of poverty is the lack of relational support of those who are not poor. So that means we just have to show up and be there. That means we have to pursue relationships in, in places that may seem really foreign to us. We have to be present, uh, we have to share information, share our networks, show people paths out of, out of poverty. So that could mean that you start volunteering at a program um, or an initiative in the city 
It might mean that you invite somebody to dinner. Or maybe it means that you move into the core city and be a neighbor to those who have struggled for years. Um, a third and final thing to consider, um, as you consider uh, moving into some of these other circles, um, just keep in mind our approach, that there's no power for change like a neighborhood or a community discerning for itself what it cares about. Um, so an essential piece of this is to identify and get behind community connectors. We were talking about that. People uh, in the community who are well connected, um, leaders who can engage the wider community to act on what they care about. And look for these community co connectors in the unlikely places, in the most broken, the most, uh, bro most broken places, in the most broken people. Uh, pour into them, learn from them, help them and the world discover the gift that's in them to make our city a little stronger, a little more vibrant, and more full of hope. I'm going to close with that Chinese poem that we already read. It hangs on my office wall, and I read it every day. Um, it reads, go to the people, live among them, learn from them, love them, start with what they know, build on what they have, but of the best leaders, when their task is accomplished, their work is done, the people all remark, we have done it ourselves. Thank you so much for having me and for listening so intently.